Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Jerusalem Mental Health Expo. My name is Stephanie Strauss, and I am privileged to serve as Executive Director of Yeshiva University in Israel. We welcome all of you and thank you so much for being here at what is sure to be a memorable and impactful event. We're in the seven weeks between Pesach and Shavuot where we read every week from Perkei Avot, The Ethics of Our Fathers. And that book is a guidebook that instructs us on how we're to live better lives, how we're to serve the Klal, and how to strengthen our community. Of course, the most famous teaching is Im einani limili uchesha'ani la'atzmi ma'ani ve'im lo achshav e'matai. Translated, if I am for myself, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? If I am only for myself, what am I? And if not, now when? Well, today's inaugural Jerusalem Mental Health Expo answers all three questions for us today. We come together today to educate and care for ourselves, to help those we love and care for that cannot help themselves, and the time to act is now. After months of COVID exasperating, exacerbating existing mental health issues and causing new challenges, today's program, today's program is nothing short of a seminal event that will change the landscape of Israel's mental health services by removing the stigma and fostering the healing. Today's event will shine a spotlight on what is available to those who seek help, as well as the work being done to heighten awareness and increase accessibility for all those who are in need of these services and support. Before calling upon our keynote speakers to share their remarks, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the many key people and organizations that have made this program a labor of love and have devoted countless hours to make today the success that it already is. First, my dear friend and sister, Deputy Mayor Jerusalem, Flor Hassan Nachum. The moment Flor says, I have an idea I want to try, you know she's going to deliver and it's going to be huge. And Flor inspires her colleagues to champion the causes that are important to her. And so we thank Jerusalem Mayor Moshe Leon and the entire Iriat Yerushalayim team for recognizing the need for this expo, for supporting it, and for intern Sam Regant and the entire engine behind the expo, Esther Nathanson, who carried this entire production from idea to perfect execution. Thank you to Rabbi Josh Fass and all the people at Nefesh Benefesh for agreeing to host us and for all of their assistance. Few people in this room can say that they would have not been positively impacted by the work of Nefesh Benefesh and their Aliyah, and we thank them for supporting this and everything else that they do for us. Special thank you to Razel Dierenfeld O'Brien for her design work and social media and website, and a huge Yasha Koach to the project manager of this expo, Tali Goldberg, who has worked tirelessly, tirelessly for many months to put it all together with creativity and grace. Back in August, when Esther convened a group of dedicated professionals to develop this idea, no one could have known how labor-intensive a project it would become. Out of that first meeting, a steering committee emerged made up of the most remarkable professionals and organizational leaders, leaders that I personally have ever had the privilege of working with. These directors and their organizations have formed the financial and professional backbone that is the Jerusalem Mental Health Expo. And at this time, I am delighted to publicly thank, thank all of them for their Herculean efforts to launch this project. Special thank you to my colleague and dear friend at Yeshiva University's Wurzweiler School of Social Work, Ms. Nechama Monk. <laughs> Speaking for both of us and for our controller, Mary Goldberg, and our entire team who have taken on some of the administrative pieces of this production, we are proud to be among the primary sponsors and leadership team of this expo. To demonstrate Yeshiva University's deep commitment to augmenting mental health services for the English-speaking population, I am thrilled to share that in the coming days, Wurzweiler and Amudim Israel, under the leadership of Yossi Goldberstein and Tzvi Glock, will announce a significant collaboration in the field to better service our constituents in the city of Jerusalem. Stay tuned for more details. Thank you to Josh Wolf, a giant of a man, and Ellie Rothstein and Kavla Noar for their constant leadership and support, as well as the Samus Foundation. To Chaim Fachler of Mayanei HaYeshua for his wisdom and insight, 
to Shlomo Katz and Relief for their unwavering commitment, and to Dr. Shmuel Harris from Machon Dvir for his expertise, clarity, and encouragement. I would also like to especially mention Kupat Cholim Klalit, who agreed to sponsor this one-of-a-kind expo dedicated to the English-speaking community. All of these mission-driven, committed mental health providers have contributed generously, and without them, today's program could not happen. So Flor is the deputy mayor of Jerusalem and also the co-founder of the UAE Israel Business Council and the Gulf Israel Women's Forum. Flor is one of the founders of this expo, as it was her idea, or brought to her, initiative that was born out of a deep concern that the longevity of living with COVID-19 was affecting everyone's mental health, with an added concern of how difficult these times have been for the Anglo community trying to navigate their way through it. As an Ola, Flor personally knows how difficult it is to be in a new country, oceans away from family. With that, I'd like to call upon Flor to say a few words. Good morning, Jerusalem. How are we doing? First of all, I want to say that anything worth doing always takes a, vin takes a village. And uh, I'm very lucky to have a very, very loving, supportive village. Um, I'll tell you the story about a year ago, just when we were coming out, a year and a half ago, we were coming out of COVID where the city of Jerusalem was very, very busy in doing practical work to help people. So food packages and for special needs families, extra help. And we were doing this throughout the sectors. And we were feeling so good with ourselves that somehow we managed to get through this terrible, terrible plague and help as many people as we possibly could and bring 35,000 volunteers to help those people. That's pretty good. But what we didn't realize was that there was a silent plague going on that nobody talks about. And that is the mental health effect of this really terrible situation, which, as Stephanie says, exacerbates a mental health plague which was already going on in the world. And somebody came to me with an idea about putting posters up to break the stigma uh, all over the city. And I went to uh, Esther Nathanson, who is my chief volunteer and, uh, and is a woman who's got a lot of experience in the care industry. And I said to her, Esther, do you think this is a good idea to try and break the stigma? Because it really is a problem. And she said, let me look into it. She comes back two weeks later and she's like, we can do much, much more. And that's when I went to Stephanie's house. If you want anything done in this town or in this country, this is the woman to do it. Stephanie, thanks to you and your leadership of YU, which is such an important asset to the city of Jerusalem, how you took the bull by the horns and you led this program forward along with myself and Esther, and of course, Cav Lenoir, which is where I met Esther to begin with. So it's all one village, as I said. Um, and of course, Nahama, how you took this through the finish line. Thank you, and Tali Goldberg. We certainly couldn't have done anything without these amazing women leading this cause. And it is a cause that we need to be dealing with. Enough, because the stigma comes with shame, and that means that people don't get help. And the numbers are staggering. Almost a third of people everywhere have some type of mental health issue. And only now is the educational ministry waking up and the kupat waking up. Thank God we've helped them wake up, thanks to Stephanie over here. And we need to start talking about it. And we need to, because this is something that people don't pray for you in short. This is something that people don't go to a hospital to visit you. And with all the community, and I see so many people who all live in communities, and somehow there are so many people that still feel alone. And what I'm, I'm very proud of two things. A, that we in Jerusalem are doing this, Mitzion Titze Torah. Torah is not just the Talmud. Torah is any methodology that improves life for people, that helps people. And Jerusalem is Zion. And so we are not only the capital, the NGO capital of the world, we have more NGOs per capita than anywhere in the world in Jerusalem. What does that say? That from Zion, etc., because everybody in this city is here deliberately, with meaning, wanting to make things better. And that is the second thing that I'm proud of, that this is the 
people or live community. People don't just make Aliyah here because they want to be by the beach or want better weather. They come because they want a life of meaning in our country, in our homeland. And everybody who comes here wants to make things better for everybody else. And so we have 35 Anglo organizations that deal with mental health. We certainly had no idea that there were so many organizations. And I think what's important about today is not just that we're all here gathering and talking about one thing and making a cry to the government and to the health system. It's also that we get to know what all each other are doing. And so we can help each other, we can refer people to each other, and we are creating the community of mental health professionals which will take this forward. And so I want to thank also our wonderful friends here at Nefesh Benefesh, Yoshua Fast, the minute I picked up the phone, we said, anything you need, we're here for you. <laughs> Yoshua Fast promised that this not, wouldn't just be a home for Nefesh Benefesh, but this would be a home for Olim, and he delivered and delivers every day. And finally, I'd like to thank the mayor of Jerusalem, who unfortunately couldn't be here, but has been involved in different organizations in the mental health space for many, many years as a volunteer, as a board member. And at the minute that we went to him and said, this is what we want to put together, he said, what can I do to help? So thank you all for being here today, and I hope it's meaningful for all of you the way that it is for us. Thank you very much. I have, known, I have known Dr. David Pelkovitz for many years, and in my role in working with all of the gap year programs, Dr. Pelkovitz has come through time and time again, year after year, to bring his wisdom, his expertise, and his Ahavat Yisrael to come and help us, help the many students that come through our doors, that come and spend time in Israel. He is also world-renowned, obviously, and that's why we're all here to listen to him. Uh, he's the foremost expert in psychological issues in the Orthodox world. He holds the Gwendolyn and Joseph Strauss Chair in Psychology and Jewish Education at the Azraeli Graduate School of Jewish Education and Administration at Yeshiva University. And he's an instructor in pastoral counseling at the Rabbi Isaac Elchanan Theological Seminary at Yeshiva University. Serving for more than two decades as Director of Psychology at North Shore University Hospital in NYU School of Medicine and Clinical Professor of Psychology at NYU School of Medicine, Dr. Pelkovitz has consulted extensively with the Jewish community in the United States, Europe, and Israel on a wide range of issues facing children and adolescents. Dr. Pelkovitz, who received his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, has published and lectured extensively on a variety of topics related to education, parenting, and child mental health. Dr. David Pelkovitz will now discuss the magic of the ordinary, promoting resilience in complicated times. Dr. Pelkovitz. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's been such an overwhelmingly positive experience since I walked through these doors. Um, you know, 35 organizations, um, each filling a central need. And um, what's been running through my mind is uh, the chicken pox analogy. Um, chicken pox analogy is. Um, Imagine two families who have a child with chicken pox. Family one, it's their fifth child. The older four also had chicken pox. And um, their next door neighbor and best friend is a pediatrician specializing in just these kind of illnesses. The other family, um, it's an only child. They live in a rural area with no easy access to medical care. And um, they um, have equal severity of chickenpox in that child. What's the different emotional response in scenario one and scenario two? In scenario one, okay, it's a pain in the neck, no big deal, but you've been through it before. You have access to care. Knowledge is a huge um, buffer against the stress. Scenario two, it's terrifying, you know? Is my child going to survive this? Will he or she be permanently damaged by this? 
that's what I think this conference is doing. Because um, I just feel it. I just feel it around here. Um, you know, everybody here who has a passion and a purpose for helping others. I was asked to speak about, um, about resilience, to focus on the positive. So I'm going to just start with um, uh, the, um, something called the resilience paradox, which is basically um, the reality that a number of resilience researchers find is most people manage to endure traumatic stress without prolonged psychological harm. For example, after 9-11 in New York, they found that um, even those who had direct loss, they showed tremendous suffering, they showed um, tremendous impact, as we've been talking about, with a clear resilience trajectory. We're wired in a way that we connect to others and we figure it out, especially when you have the kind of amazing services I've been um, hearing about um, all morning. Okay, let's, uh, let's um, move on here. Um, okay. Um, okay. I think I'm going to um, start by talking a little bit about um, the three C's, okay? Coping, connection, and creating meaning. Coping, and as those who have heard me speak before, you know that um, I uh, use a lot of stories. I hope it's okay, but um, it's uh, what we tend to remember when we process with uh, that part of our brain. So um, here's the research, and nobody's going to be surprised by this. Some people deal with coping um, and with stress by distracting themselves. Some deal by attending. Something I, I often quote, and many of us are familiar with this from various sources, that three times in, in the Gemara, three times in Talmud, it says on the passage in Mishlei, Daga Belev Ish Yashchena. So there's two ways of seeing how to deal with anxiety. One way is Yashchena Midato you know, from the word hesachadas, shin v'samach mischalfen. And I apologize for my horrible Hebrew pronunciation. I hope all the Anglos in the audience can relate to, uh, and, I, and I went to. I'm not much better time. Okay, good. Um, and then the other, the other um, way of seeing it is yashichen alacherem, that you light up the language centers of the brain by naming the monster and talking about it, which is again what all of you do, you know. And that's the power of not living with suffering and pain and trauma and stress alone. Um, I had a um, very close collaboration with uh, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, who's familiar to many of you, a Harvard um, a psychiatrist and a Boston University psychiatrist who specializes in trauma. And I once, um, we were collaborating on a paper together on uh, uh, PTSD field trials. And he comes running into my office all excited because he shows me that he just done an fMRI on one of his patients who um, was stuck in the stairwell of the World Trade Center on 9-11 and thought that he was about to die. Miraculously, he managed to survive. And he shows me the picture. And the first thing that runs through my mind when I see the picture is that Broca's area, the language centers of the brain, are shut down when you're reliving the worst moment of your life and you feel you're about to die, your language shuts down, right? It's, um, we're told in, in the Torah, Vayidom Aaron, when Aaron hears about the horrible trauma of the loss of his sons, he, he, he has total silence. And the Barbanel tells us, why, why the word Vayidom? Usually the word would be Sheket, not to Mimut. And he says, because there's a big difference here. When you have that level trauma, you're literally shut down. You're literally shut down. But then, what Dr. Vander Kolk showed me is something phenomenal. He showed me that as he gave his client words for his pain, 
as he helped him find meaning for his pain. And to put it in the context of growth, that's when the healing began. And you literally saw, he, he has these slides that um, are incredible. Because you see, literally, the language centers of the brain lighting up and then tracking alongside that the emotional healing of this man's soul. Now, um, let, me, um, let me start with coping. And I'm going to talk to you about the um, five coping rooms, which is one of my favorite stories on coping. And um, again, some of you have heard this, but it, it really changed the way I view the kind of traumatic events we're talking about. Here's, here's, here's the story. Um, I was um, in Israel uh, spending a couple of weeks with the team that was in charge of letting people know when um, they had lost a family member in a pigua. This was at the height of the uh, Second Intifada. And um, it was a horrible time. There wasn't a day that went by without um, pigua after pigua. It was just, it was just horrific. And um, to, to skip to the heart of the story, um, we're sitting in this room. By the way, they, these, these were therapists I was working with for two weeks. They know much more about trauma and their little pinky than I'll know in my entire life. These were real, real experts, as the people sitting in this room are. And there's a bomb. It was right down the road from us. It was a, a terrible um, tragedy. Um, and um, they um, immediately, the room cleared out where everybody had to go. They had to go and tell people, you just lost your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your son, your daughter. It was horrific. And um, as I'm sitting there, um, I'm in the room alone with um, the head of the Jerusalem Trauma Center, Dr. Danny Brahm at the time, and um, Dr. Ruth Pat Horensic, who's, who many of you may know is a professor specializing in this area at Hebrew University. And um, they um, come to me and um, they say, we just got a call that they just found somebody else. She's um, uh, um, one of the madrichot in a camp in the middle of the country. They didn't have any therapists left to go, so they asked me if I'd go. So I went, and luckily Dr. Pat Horenza came with me. Um, and um, what the director of the camp told me is what this story is about. He said, I walk into the room, because supposedly we were going to tell all of the campers about the horrible tragedy, and we were going to spend the day with them helping them cope. They're way too smart for that in this country. The director of the camp gets up, and he's, he puts me and my colleague in the corner. And he says, listen, he says, we're going to have five coping rooms, five rooms to help you cope. One room is the talking room. You go and you talk about your feelings. The next room is a writing room. Write everything out. Write your feelings out, the power of writing. You know, some of you are doing amazing work, you know, based on the work of Dr. Pennebaker and others on the power of writing with health and, uh, you know, kalakavo to the work that you do. Um, I'm meeting so many people here who are so inspiring. It's just that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm on a high. Okay, so, um, so there was writing, there was music, they expressed themselves musically. Art room, art is making, um, one expert in resilience says um, it's making something out of nothing and humor is making nothing out of something. Okay, <laughs> so there was an art room, there was a, a tefillah room where they could sit down and daven. And there was um, a talking room where they could sit down and talk with me and my colleague. They were told, stay in one room for a little while, and then when you finish with that room, go from room to room to room throughout the day. And we were spending the whole day there. What well, was fascinating, nobody, nobody switched their rooms. The kids um, divided themselves exactly equally among four of the five rooms. Okay? One room nobody chose. Anybody want to guess what it was? Almost everybody says talking, and I certainly expect that from, from us. Um, very good. 
Very good. We have a real expert here, right? Um, tefillah. Tefillah. It was too soon, right? We, we have to be in a place where we're ready for that kind of spiritual connection. And it was an amazing day. The talkers talked, and the artists did their art, and the musicians did their music, and it was, uh, it was incredibly powerful. Next week was the first anniversary of 9-11. I was asked to give a talk, a Naskara talk, um, um, in Manhattan. And um, as I'm speaking there, um, 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 I told the story of the five coping rooms. A woman comes up to me, and she's sort of crying, and she says that um, her, thanks, she said that her um, father was a Vishnitsa Chassid in the camps, in the concentration camps. And um, he was um, somebody who was um, um, incredibly um, open in talking about his suffering in the camps. And what happened was that um, she was going to go to Manhattan to hear Elie Wiesel speak about at the first anniversary. His father, father said, listen, he says, I, I don't think that Ellie's going to remember me and the guys at so many years ago. It's like almost you know, 70 years ago. Probably won't remember me. He says, please, just give him you know, um, regards from us and let him know that we, um, we are so proud of him. We're not only proud of his Nobel Prize, we're proud of everything he's done, how he didn't let the world forget, how he gave words for our pain. We are, we are just amazingly proud. So she goes over and she tells Professor Wiesel, I have regards for my father. He doesn't think that you'll remember him. Immediately, Professor Wiesel, his eyes tear up. He says, remember him? He didn't tell you that the only reason I'm alive is because of him? Shali Shalo. He said, that Nobel Prize is more his than mine. Everything I've done is because of him. He tells the following story that I'll end this section, the coping section with. He says there was a day that was horrific, even by concentration camp standards. We were beyond endurance. And a group of Russian prisoners of war got a hold of some rat poison. And they all lined up online, and they said, look, they're going to kill us anyway. Let's take matters into our own hand. Let's go from passive to active. They all wait online take the poison, sorry for the horrible imagery, and that was the end of their lives. He says, every adolescent in the camp, he says, um, was online behind them, patiently waiting to make that our last moments on this earth. Everybody, he says, except your father, the chassid. <clears throat> he goes to the side of the line, and he breaks in to the ancient vision of Sinigin, I believe in ultimate redemption. We all believe that a better time is going to come. We all believe in hope. We all believe in purpose. And he says, your father's song broke our suicidal spell. We all surrounded your father, every one of us danced around him, singing the animamin. He says, go home and tell your father that, that everything I've ever accomplished is because of that animamin. That's what we have to remember. It's the power of connection, the power of purpose. And that's, um, that's that story. Um, next. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about... Um, as we go from coping, I want to talk a little bit about uh, connection, the power of being there. And again, um, you've all heard this study, which many of us are familiar with. It's the bottom of the hill study. Okay? These research researchers um, take people to the bottom of a hill. And they say, estimate the steepness of this hill. Very well for the life, we're at the bottom of a hill. And here's what they find. If you're alone, you see the hill is very steep. If you have somebody at your side, the hill 
looks less steep, and the closer you feel to the person at your side, the less steep the hill looks, and the less tired you get walking up the hill. But here, again, in terms of the core beauty of this magnificent conference, um, here's what they find also, the same researchers. They have people who were burdened by the stigma of a secret. They might be burdened by not telling anybody about mental health challenges or about a suicide in, in, in the past, or about something that leads to shame and silence and a pulling in. And guess what they find? When you're able to find somebody to share with and to reach out to, everything looks less steep. You feel lighter. And I just think that there's that something about that imagery is also uh, flashing through my mind with this. Um, so, um, okay, so that's on connection. Next, I wanted to talk a little bit about, very briefly, about the three island studies. A lot of what we know about resilience comes from looking at th three islands, okay? Because that's the purest form of research, longitudinally. So it was the um, uh, Kauai study, Okay, by Dr. Werner, a woman who led that study, and it's still going on, even though it started in 1956. The Isle of Wight study, off the coast of Bournemouth, and the Martha's Vineyard study, all islands. And those, island, those places at that time were places filled with the poverty in certain sections, and crime, and, and abuse, and sexual abuse, etc. And they looked at what predicts resilience, okay? And I'll get to the core. Guess what predicts which one of those children born in 1956 grew up to be resilient? By the way, resilient doesn't mean that it didn't impact on you. Of course it impacts on you. Of course it impacts on you. We, ca we carry, you know, the um, signs of trauma, the impact of trauma and difficult times with us. But we also carry victorious spirits that are what we're all about here. So um, you know what they found? And I'm being very going down to the basics here. If you had one person who cares, see, it's all it takes, one person who cares and is there for you. Or as one of my, um, one of my colleagues once mentioned at a trauma conference I was at, one person in your life who you could wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning if you're bothered by something and you really need to talk. When I saw that study, somehow my brain was primed to um, wake up at 3 in the morning and I shake my poor wife and I say, Lonnie, 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 can I talk to you about something? And she says, yeah, 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 what, 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 what's wrong? What could you do? So I said, go back to sleep. You know? So um, not easy being married to a psychologist, especially if you're a lawyer. Okay. So, um, and, but the other thing, which is again what this room is infused with, is the power of required helpfulness, of chesed, you know? where you tell kids, I see that in this country all the time. Israel does it really right, you know? You can't be in a place of Magili. You, you have to help out, you have to help out. When I walk through the streets here and I see older kids watching younger kids, you don't want to overburden them and rob them of their childhood. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done in certain um, areas of parenting, in certain areas of um, doing a better job in, in terms of giving children the right to be children. But what we have here is the chesed and the required helpfulness, the core of those uh, three uh, island studies. Okay. Um, and then the final, so we just did coping. We did connection, and now I'm going to end this with creating meaning. How much time do I have? Two minutes. I have a great story for you. No, no. Oh, I, I'm not going to mess with the Chaver Knesset. Please. I'll come back a little later and I'll. Please do. Oh, I love it.
חברי הכנסת, מיכל וולביגר has joined us from the Religious Zionist Party. She has established a Munatech organization for the families of those suffering from dual illness diagnoses. Additionally, she took part in the establishment of Addicted to Life, the Association for Victims of Addiction. She serves today as the chairman of Bat Ami Association, which was created to place national Israeli youth and women in their national service in Shiro Lomi, and currently serves as the Knesset chair for the Mental Health Lobby, Personal and Social Resilience Lobby, the Drug Abuse Lobby, and is chair of the National Civil Service Lobby. Please welcome Michal Vandegar. אז צהריים טובים, אני אאתגר אתכם ואדבר בעברית, אז תצטרכו להקשיב, לא תהיה לכם ברירה. אני, תיארנו בינינו, הוא רצה פשוט מנוחה, לנוח קצת, נכון? תיארנו את זה? אז הוא נח קצת, אני ממש לא אגזול הרבה זמן, כי אני חייבת לטוס לכנסת, זה לא רחוק מפה, למרות שההבדל בין להיות פה ללהיות שם, שמיים וארץ, בסדר? אבל בסדר, נתגבר. אז אני מברכת את האכסניה, נפש בנפש, לא בכדי הם נקראים נפש בנפש, כי האדם הוא גוף ונפש, ויש לנו נטייה, כשאני אומרת לנו, זה גם לחברה, אבל גם למדינה, להתייחס יותר לגוף ופחות לנפש. 74 שנה המדינה שלנו דחקה הצידה את נושא של הנפש, וכתוצאה מכך, אני לא יודעת מה בא קודם, הביצה או התרנגולת, האם החברה ולכן המדינה והכנסת, או האם המדינה והכנסת ואחרי זה החברה. בכל מקרה, כולנו חיים אה, בדחיקה הצידה של הנפש, ויותר מתייחסים לגוף שלנו. אה, והגיע הזמן לשנות. כדי שיהיה לכולנו, כפרטים בתוך החברה, ולחברה בכלל, חוסן, כדי שנצליח להתקדם. בהגשמה העצמית של כל אחד ואחד מאיתנו, אבל בוודאי כחברה, כמדינה יהודית, אנחנו צריכים לבנות חוסן. ולצערי הרב, אנחנו לא עשינו את זה עד כה, או לפחות לא עשינו את זה מספיק טוב. ואני שמחה וגאה אפילו שבכל מקרה הסיעה שממנה אני נמצאת, המפלגה שלי, ציונות דתית, החליטה שהיא בהחלט נותנת לזה מקום. ומאז שאני בכנסת, אנחנו עכשיו לא מזמן ציינו שנה, אני באמת מנסה בכל הכוח, יחד עם uh, עוד חברי כנסת, אגב, באמת מכל סיעות הבית, uh, שלאו דווקא אנחנו רואים עין בעין איתם בנושאים מדיניים, ביטחוניים, או אפילו חברתיים. בנושא הזה אני מצליחה באמת לגרוף כמה שיותר חברי כנסת כדי שנעשה שינוי. והשינוי הוא, ופה אני מסיימת, uh, בכמה כיוונים. דרך אחת זה תודעתי, זה להעלות למודעות, זה לדבר על זה, לא להחביא את זה, להגיד זה קיים, גם בכנסת, כולנו עם סטיגמות, גם אנחנו כהורים לאנשים מתמודדים, גם אם יש לנו במשפחה, עדיין אנחנו סוחבים סטיגמות ששנים על שנים ככה נולדנו וככה גידלו אותנו. אז גם, אני לא אגלה לכם סוד, גם אנשי מקצוע, יסלח לי, כבודו, גם הם נגועים בסטיגמות, גם בכנסת, כולנו נגועים בסטיגמות, צריך לדבר על זה ופשוט למגר את הסטיגמה, להגיד די, בריאות הנפש היא כמו כל דבר אחר. אז זה צד אחד שאנחנו עושים ואנחנו מצליחים בו היטב, באמת, עד כדי כך שיש חברי כנסת שנאבקים איתי מי ייקח את התחום. תקשיבו, אם נאבקים איתך, סימן שזה טוב, נכון? אז באמת צריך לברך, להסתכל בעין טובה על כל דבר. אז זה הנושא האחד. והנושא השני באמת להביא לשינויים, כלומר שינויים דה פקטו, תקציבים, משאבים, נהלים לשנות, חוקים היום, בספר החוקים במדינת ישראל, יש לא מעט חוקים שבתוכם יש אפליה, יש לא מעט חוקים שהם לגבי מקצועות שדורשים רישיון, אתה צריך להיות פסיכולוג, אתה צריך רישיון, אתה צריך להיות רופא, אתה צריך רישיון, אתה עורך דין, ובחוקים האלה, בתוך ספר, ספרי החוקים של מדינת ישראל, יש אפליה בתוך הספר שכתוב מי לא יכול לקבל רישיון, מישהו שחולה במחלת נפש. למה? מה הקשר? יש היום את חוק שוויון זכויות אנשים עם מוגבלות, שבהחלט קובע חוק יסוד, שאסור להפלות אדם בשל המחלה שלו. אם, המח... אם באמת הוא לא מסוגל לתפקיד, מאה אחוז, תבדקו, אבל בגלל שיש לו מחלה כזו או אחרת, למה הוא? אז אנחנו נאבקים גם לשינוי חקיקתי, 
גם לשינוי של לתת יותר תקציבים לעולם בריאות הנפש. על כל, ה, על כל הקשת הרחבה של מבתי החולים ועד הקהילה, מטיפול ועד שיקום ועוד כהנה וכהנה. אז אמרתי שזה יהיה קצר ואני אוכל לדבר על זה שעות, וראיתי שכל כך נהניתם ותארו, אז אני אתן לכם להמשיך לשמוע את השיחה המופלאה הזאת. אני מתנצלת שאני חייבת לטוס, ואני שמחה, באמת, אני מקווה שזה כנס ראשון מני רבים. אז יישר כוח והמשך כנס מענג. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Yeah, um... Okay. Um... So, um... Yeah. So what I was up to was the, um, the sea of creating meaning, okay? Uh, which is so important, you know, it's, it's, it's so crucial. It's uh, the why. We always have to answer the why in life. And um, there's a concept of um, post-traumatic growth, which I'm sure we've all heard about. Um, and it's the reality that um, when really difficult things happen, it's often a source of, um, of not just trauma, but also a source of growth. Um, you know, many people um, attribute the greatness of Israel and the amazing success of this country to, um, to unfortunately, You know, trauma after trauma, war after war, what is it, you know, from 48, 56, 67, and it just goes on, on and on and on. And it forged this amazing, amazing place. And one of the, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's, so, it's so clear. But um, any time we're able to go through difficult times and bring it from threat to challenge, To see what's going on as a challenge and as a potential growth experience, it makes uh, an enormous difference. There is a beautiful medrash to Hillam that I'm sure many of us are familiar with. I just love it. Um, and it goes like this. It says, Ilu nafalti lo kamti. Ilu yashafti bachoshech. Lo haya orli. If I never fell down, I never would have gotten up. If I never sat in the darkness, I never would have appreciated the light. You see it all the time. You see it in shiva houses. You see it in, in sitting at the bedside of somebody who may, God forbid, be terminally ill. We see it in, even in survivors of sexual abuse or... Um, or um, the kind of um, mental health challenges that have people living with the pain of depression, of anxiety. And that approach is one that's associated with doing much better. There's a, um, the president of Yale University. His name is Dr. Solovey, S-O-L-O-V-E-Y, which, um, as many of you know, is short for Soloveitchik. He's a descendant of the Brisker dynasty. Didn't really know that until um, relatively recently, but he found himself, um, my father, um, Zal, used to call this ancestral alchemy. He would find himself pulled towards um, talking about, in his research, um, talking about um, the power of going from a place of feeling that your stress is caused by random causes with no meaning to understanding the purpose of your stress and seeing the growth part of going from go roll, meaning like you feel like you're a log floating on the river at the, to yiyud, to being a man and woman of destiny, 
that there's a purpose, there's a growth purpose um, to what I'm going through. And when you're able to see that, which is, again, what's been termed post-traumatic growth, you do much better. It just, cha it just changes things, you know, um, in, 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 in a way that um, I, I find, um, find um, you know, very, uh, very heartening. Um, I'll just share with you one, one um, study, um, and, um, and then I'll move on. Um, it's uh, the hotel maid study. It just shows how it, it's all, you know, as the Baal Shem Tov said, You want to know where the person is, you look at his or her thoughts. That's where your essence are. That's where you do it. My, um, my mother-in-law died um, over the end of the Chag, um, Chatsi Butler. And um, she was a remarkable woman. She died at 99, very, very happy life. And she and my father-in-law, who went through all kinds of things during the war and whatever, they often said, not in a Pollyanna way, I never had a bad day in my life. Because they developed that power of optimism and that power of being able to always focus on the positive. And it drew them, you know, it drew to them, um, it was a shiva with um, thousands of people. It drew, it, it, it was just, it was just an, an, an amazing experience. But let me um, tell you the hotel maid study. Um, um, doctor, they take a, a group of uh, people who are working as maids in a hotel. Half are randomly assigned to do whatever maids always do. Doesn't sound like a, such a fascinating job. You know, you uh, change sheets and you dust and you vacuum and you clean. Half of these maids were randomly assigned to do exactly what maids do. The same thing that the other group did, but it was infused with purpose. They were told, look, you have a very important job. We're studying wellness in the workplace. So when you dust the top shelves in this room, remember, you're, you're, you're working your, um, upper, your upper arm muscles. And when you vacuum, it's cardiovascular kind of exercise. And every single action of a hotel maid was broken down into something that was just good for them. Exact same thing. Within six months, the hotel maids who were in the wellness section of the study, they lost a lot of weight. They lost a lot of weight. They were looking to lose weight, but they just lost weight. Um, okay? Don't try this at home, anybody, okay? Um, they lost weight. They, um, their happiness levels shot up, okay? Because, you know, what's simcha? As one of my colleagues says, it's sham moach. It's to put your head into a place of purpose and connection to the three active ingredients of simcha, right? Right? The three Fs, what is it, everybody? Family, friends, and what's the third F? I knew nobody would get it, okay? Family, friends, and faith. Family, friends, and faith. Okay, when I speak to a group of, uh, I, I better, I'll stay, let me stay appropriate. Okay. When I speak to a group of girls, high school girls in the United States, they all say the third F is food. And the boys just smile. Um, okay. Okay, let me, um, let me, um, let me end with the story. I'm, I'm, I'm about there. I'm good? Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with, um, I have, um, well, you, you know what, let me just end with how to help the depressed person, okay? It's obvious, but it's, um, it's, it's so important to talk about. And I'm just going to read my slide. The most important thing anyone can do for the depressed person is to help him or her get an appropriate diagnosis and treatment. This may involve encouraging the individual to stay with treatment until symptoms begin to abate. It's usually several weeks. Or to seek different treatment if no improvement occurs. Depression is very, very treatable. The Hebrew word tikva, as you know, is tied to the word kav, a rope or a cord. We're not dangling sort of on a cord disconnected from anybody. We're always connected to our family and friends and faith. And that's the essence of, of, of what tikva is. In, in, in a magnificent medrash, it says, talking about, I think, getting us ready for kivu, getting us ready for COVID. I heard this from Rabbi Dr. David Fox. It says, um, 
Hakol B'kivoy. Every challenge in life has to be dealt with hope, right? Um, Yisurin, B'kivoy, suffering, has to be dealt with with hope, okay? And ultimately, Gula is B'kivoy. So um, I, I um, you know, um, so you need to offer emotional in store, which means understanding, being at their side, trying to understand, reflecting um, empathy. Um, of course, never ignore remarks about suicide. You know, report them to the depressed person's therapist or somebody who they're close to. Um, activity planning. You know that something as simple and basic as having the depressed person do one activity that gives them mastery during the day and one activity that gives them what everybody in the activity planning research? One that gives them mastery and one that um, gives them um, some kind of, uh, you know, some, some, some kind of meaning, just to, you know, some, some kind of chesed is as associated with getting over depression as taking medication. Obviously medication is crucial very often, but activity planning is, is, is extremely important, okay? Um, don't accuse a depressed person of faking illness or laziness or expect him to snap out of it. Eventually with treatment, most people do get better. Reassure the depressed person that with time and help, he, her, um, you know, th th that, 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 that things will get better. And that's really true, okay? Um, okay, um, I'm gonna end with, um, I'm, I'm at the end. Here's my final story. I have three stories and um, um, I'm going to try to do them very quick, and if I can, okay. the, the first one is uh, one of my favorites. It's um, the homeless conference. I just love this story. A um, number of years ago, I was invited to um, speak at a homeless conference. I was very excited because I pictured going to this address in the middle of Manhattan to uh, hang out with homeless people. What could be more interesting? then, uh, you know, these are the people who have gone through life with challenges and with, uh, who was saying earlier, there's uh, very little homelessness in the United States. Is Dr. Korf no, still here? Israel. 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 Oh, we're in, we're in Israel. Okay. Um, there's very, that there's very, I, what is it, a thousand, a thousand homeless people in the whole, in the whole country, which is, what, what, what are the numbers? Well, in Jerusalem, it's a few hundred, so I don't know yeah. it's a whole country. But that's amazing. You know, on one block in New York City, you have, you know, it's just, it's, 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 it's incredible. So I get there, and there are two speakers. So there was, um, turns out that it wasn't on the street. It was um, 400 professionals who specialize in homelessness who were in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Okay? <laughs> what a disappointment, okay? And I get in, and I see um, that on the stage is the other speaker, who um, immediately I start feeling like, whoa, okay, I'm going to be the comic relief here, because here, here's who this guy is. It says, Dr. So-and-so is in charge of homeless policy for the United States government. It says he went to the Dalton School, one of the finest private schools in the United States. From there he went to... Um, um, Harvard for his undergraduate degree. From there he got his PhD. Says he won an Oscar for a documentary he made on homelessness last year. And it goes on and on and on. And he's this very good looking guy in a really beautiful suit. I don't usually notice clothing. He was in a suit that was worth at least $100. Okay. No, you, feed you can feed 100 people. All right, exa exactly. That's, that, that's, the, that's the way you use the, the way a mayor speaks. Okay, so um, he gets up, and the first words out of his mouth were so shocking that you almost saw 400 mental health professionals collectively faint. Here are his words. He says, when I was 11 years old, he said I was an only child, and in front of me, my father in a coked up rage turned a gun first on my mother, taking her life, and then on himself. He said, I can't describe to you the level of trauma that that put me through. 
He said, and I knew I was about to fall in the hands of the foster care system, which in his part of the United States was really horrific. So he says, I ran away. He said, I look a little older for the, the, you know, than my age. And I go for the next two years from homeless shelter to homeless shelter. When I thought they might be on to me, I'd run away again. He said, I was just riddled with symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, of depression, of crippling anxiety. He said, it was horrific. It was horrific. He said, until I came to a shelter in Midtown Manhattan where I heard from the director of the shelter four words that explain everything that you've seen on my CV. Anything I've ever accomplished are for those, for those four words. So you see 400 pens come out. <laughs> Here's Roy's looking for the answer, the answer. And he says, put your pens away. He says, it wasn't the words, it was how they were spoken. The director of the shelter comes over to me, puts his arm around me in an appropriate way, and he says, how are you doing? And I saw from the look in his eyes, from the way his soul bounced off mine, he really wanted to know, and I started to tell him. And the more I told him, the more I wanted to tell him. And it came out like a flood. It came out, and that's when my tears came, and, and, and everything caught up with me. And I spent a couple of months in that shelter. He made time for me. He saw I was a bright guy. And he gets me a scholarship to Dalton, and from, Dalton, and from there I go on to Harvard, and here I am. Here I am. All from those four words. I find we often underestimate the power of being at somebody's side. And one last study, one last story. It's a story, um, simple story, that has to do with um, my parents. Um, my father and mother, many, many years ago, so they were rabbi and Rebetzin in a shul in, um, in, I think it was in Akron, Ohio. Okay? Any Akronians here? Um, and um, and um, I'd given a talk here, and to thank me, one of the organizations I gave a talk for, um, they dropped off a piece of art by a well-known Israeli artist. And they say, here, you know, we want to thank you. And they give me this beautiful piece of art. And I go to hang it up in my office in Yeshiva University. And in the back, I see there's a note. And I take the note out. And she says, uh, dear Dr. Pelkovitz, I understand this piece of art is for you. She says, let me tell you something about about my early childhood. She says, when I was four years old, right in front of me, one horrible day, my 40-year-old father, who was the core of our family, had a massive heart attack, and he died. He said, and I was left not only with losing my father, but I lost my mother also, because she was, she was gone. She, was, she just couldn't be there anymore. She was grieving so deeply. You know, that kind of loss. So she says, you know something? Um, I, um, I didn't think we would be able to go on. She says, but I'll tell you what got me through. Every day during that whole horrible time, for much of the year, your father and your mother came to my house. And I don't remember them saying a word. They would just sit down next to me, next to my mother, and they cried. They cried. They tried not to cry. I don't think they said very much. She said, please call your father. My mother had already died. Just call your father. Let him know that the woman I am today, and she'd become a very successful person, everything I've accomplished is because of the silence and the connection of your parents sitting at my side. So I called my father up. I said, what, what, what did you do? And he said, I don't know. He <laughs> said, I don't think I did anything. We just sat. She said, I remember it very well. But that's what we always have to remember. Very often, our most potent magic sauce is sitting at people's sides, just being there. Never underestimated. So thank you, everybody, for an amazing experience. And, um, and, um, thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Palkovitz. Thank you all for listening. We're going to move on to the next panel. For those that were registered, please, you can stay where you are. For those that did not register for the panel, kindly make your way out of the doors in the back as soon as possible so we can keep to our schedule. Thank you all for being here. Your validation of this event is tremendous, and we hope to do more.